Well, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, yeah, the, um, the, the, the papers that have been given as part of the research talks in your series have an amazing track record, so I'm, uh, I'm very honored to be a part of this series. Um, so, but today I'm not giving the research talk, today I'm just giving the, the uh, intro talk, not just giving, but giving the intro talk on uh, psychological egoism. So, psychological egoism is a view that, you can't say it's universally rejected by philosophers, uh, but you can say that um, there aren't, you won't find very many philosophers who endorse psychological egoism. So this is one of those rare cases where we actually have pretty widespread agreement in philosophy, which is, uh, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Um, but outside of philosophy, I, I think you, you will encounter this view, um, you know, pretty often. So I think it's, a, it's an important view for us philosophers to talk about. So let me just sort of introduce it by way of anecdote, something that happens uh, when, that often happens when we teach ethics, either in intro classes or in ethics classes. I don't teach ethics classes, but uh, I've heard this also happens in ethics classes. So. Uh, Right, so in, in Kant's uh, you know, famous work, uh, Groundwork for the Metaphysics of Morals, he has us consider this example of this shopkeeper. And uh, he wants us to contrast uh, sort of doing one thing for one motive versus doing that same thing for a different motive. Um, and so he has us consider the shopkeeper, and in one version of the case, the shopkeeper uh, gives everyone the same price on whatever goods it is that he's selling, because he thinks it's the morally right thing to do. Whereas in the other version of the case, the shopkeeper also gives everyone the same price, but not, not because he thinks it's the morally right thing to do, but because he thinks it's good business. So, you know, giving everyone the same price will earn him a good reputation, uh, which will, you know, keep people coming to his, to his shop. And so Kant wants to contrast these cases, doing something because you think it's right, you know, as Kant says, out of duty, versus doing something uh, for selfish motives. So often when we present this kind of case, or students read Kant, they think uh, that this sort of first kind of case isn't really possible. No one really does things out of a sense of duty, and they actually, every time anyone does something, it's really for selfish motives. So they might think, well, okay, yeah, the shopkeeper is doing it because he thinks it's morally right, um, but that's only because he, he only does what's morally right, because he wants to be seen as someone who does what's morally right, and therefore have a good reputation, um, and therefore have good business, right? So, so students will often say, this is really just the same case described in sort of two different ways. In both cases, the shopkeeper is selfishly motivated. I actually heard recently uh, that, uh, I didn't know this, that Kant actually had a shopkeeper as a friend. So this is kind of like based on like a real life example, and I guess he would go on long walks with the shopkeeper friend, and they would talk about why the shopkeeper is doing this, they would argue about it. Um, okay, so so according to again according to psychological egoism, all actions are selfishly motivated. Um, so I think a lot of people find this view kind of uh, kind of natural. Like once they start once they start thinking about what what motivates our actions. But um, what I, what I what I want to do today is uh, argue against it, or at least argue that the arguments given in its favor aren't very good. So, sort of, what I think is sort of most significant or interesting about psychological egoism is that if it's true, then basically all views in mainstream ethics, um, by which I mean like all views that are sort of taken seriously by professional ethicists, are wrong. Because all of those views um, argue that uh, we, we all, very often, not always, but we very often ought to do things for non-selfish motivation. And if you ought to do something, it's plausible that you can do it. And so all of these views entail that we can do things for non-selfish non -selfish motivations. But if psychological egoism is right, that's not true. And so all of these views have got to go. Now, uh, you know, not only is that sort of intellectually important, but it's also like kind of sort of important for you, like in your life. Because if it's true, then like you don't have to pay attention in ethics class anymore. Like you know, uh, uh, you, you know, all of these ethical theories that they're being taught have got to be wrong if psychological egoism is true. So I was a psychological egoist when I was in, uh, at least first year or two as an undergrad, and this was a great excuse for me not to pay attention in ethics class. And maybe I would have become an, an ethicist if I had uh, paid more attention. But 
Okay, so, 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 so if it is true, it's, it's really sort of significant, but the question is, is it true, or maybe a bit more precisely, is there any reason to believe it's true? So the first thing to say, um, I think, is that even psychological egoists will admit that their view is revisionary. It, that is to say that it goes against the common sense view. The common sense view of human motivation uh, for action is that actions are motivated by a mix of selfish motives, altruistic motives, that is, motives you know, um, uh, that concern the benefit of others. Um, and, and so, so there are cases that are purely self, selfishly motivated, cases that are purely altruistically, and cases that are motivated where actions are motivated by, by a mixture. Um, and the common sense view seems to be supported when we sort of look inside of ourselves, so we call it introspection. And you know, you, you perform some action, you sort of look inside, you go, what did it, what was motivating me when I did that? It really seems like, you know, there's at least in some cases, you're motivated by um, you know, the desire to like make others happy, something like that. Um, so you're not you're not selfishly motivated, you're concerned with other people's happiness. But of course, appearances can be deceiving, right? And we all know this. Um, so just because it seems that the common sense view is true doesn't mean that it is true. But it does mean that if we're going to go for psychological egoism, I think we'd like a good argument for psychological egoism. Why should we believe that appearances are deceiving in this way? So I'm going to consider several arguments. So the first argument is a rather, we call flat-footed argument. Um, it just says, look, you can't prove that the common sense view is true. In other words, you can't prove psychological egoism is false. So often when we discuss psychological egoism in class, and there's a student who like, wants to argue against psychological egoism, they'll bring up this example of uh, someone jumping on a grenade to save his or her comrades in battle, right? Um, so, you know, and this is supposed to be a sort of paradigm case of someone that's like motivated to, you know, protect others and give up his or her own life to do so. So, you know, what could be a clearer case of non-selfishly motivated action? But of course, as psychological egoists, they always have a response, and you know, they say, you know, they'll come up with various ideas. Um, one of them might be something like, well, look, the person knew that if they didn't jump on the grenade, um, then, you know, the con the, you know, and they survived somehow, that their comrades that did survive would, you know, sort of look down on them, you know, treat them, you know, poorly for the rest of their lives. And maybe, oh, and then they would also maybe be living with some guilt for not having done it, and that would be worse than dying. Right? And so the idea is that uh, this, after all, this you, you know, really was a selfishly motivated act of jumping on the grenade. So I think what we should say about this is that it's always possible to come up with you know, some story right, that's going to s square your view with the evidence, right? like with, with the behavior. And that's true of psychological egoism. That's also true of a view according to which behavior is purely altruistically motivated. There's always some way to like tell the story where it's, it's selfish motivation that's going on. But of course, uh, that doesn't give us any reason to believe that that story is true. It just establishes that we can't prove it's false. But we basically can't prove anything is false. And the question is, again, is do we have any good reason to believe that it's true? Um, so the second argument I'd like to consider is this idea that, look, we know from, you know, sort of some very plausible basic assumption about, about action, intentional action anyway, uh, is that it's motivated by desire. Whenever you act, you're acting on a desire. That is to say, you're acting for the fulfillment of whatever it is you desire. That is to say, you're, um, uh, you're acting selfishly. Right? So that's, the, that's this kind of argument from, from, from desires. Now, if you notice the sort of pattern of that argument, there was a series of steps. Right? So we started by saying, you're motivated by desires. That is to say, you're motivated by, uh, uh, sorry, you're acting to fulfill your desire. That is to say, you're acting selfishly. So there's like a series of steps, and each step in the argument seems like it's just a sort of restatement of the previous step. But we get to a sort of surprising conclusion from a rather plausible starting point. Uh, Andy Coulson has nicknamed that style of argument uh, the Rambler's fallacy. But to sort of see what's wrong with it, uh, right, so let's first just consider this, this 
theory of, of action. So, so this idea that, that, our, that all action is motivated by, by desire, the most plausible version of that, or I think the most plausible version of that theory, or probably, I guess, the most pop, um, popular version of that theory, is called the belief-desire theory of action. So according to this theory, um, it's not, you know, a, a desire alone won't motivate you to act in a certain way, but a desire sort of paired with the right kind of belief. So you've got a desire for water, You've got a, a desire for water. That alone isn't going to like motivate me to act in a way. But that desire combined with my belief that there's water in here will cause me to, you know, a certain action, drink the water. All right, so that's called the belief desire theory of motivation. Sometimes it's called the Humean theory of motivation, named after David Hume. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's pretty plausible. It's controversial in philosophy, but let's just grant it. Let's just assume that that's right. That's, that's really how uh, motivated action works. The problem is that it just doesn't follow that all action is selfishly motivated. There's an implicit assumption when we move from, from the premise that all actions are caused by desires to the conclusion that all action is uh, selfishly motivated. And the implicit assumption is that all desires are self-directed. So we can distinguish between, or philosophers do distinguish between, what we call self-directed desires, that are, that is, desires for oneself to have or be some way, versus other directed desires, which are desires for someone else to have something or to be a certain way. Um, so can consider, to see the contrast, we can see we can look at a Kant's example. So suppose I'm, I'm the shopkeeper. On the one hand, I might have the desire for me to get money. On the other hand, I might have the desire for you to get a fair deal. In both cases, they're my desires. So in both, in both cases, they're desires that belong to me. But the object of my desire in one case, um, or the, the content of my desire in one case, has to do with me, and the content of that of desire in the other case has to do with you. And only if all of our desires are, are self-directed desires would it follow from this assumption that all action is selfishly motivated. So again, uh, you, you know, it's possible that, that all desires are self-directed desires, but it certainly doesn't seem so. I mean, it certainly seems like we have desires for other people to have or be a certain way. Now, at this point, the sort of standard, um, you know, response is something like, well, okay, okay, I get it. We have desires directed at other people. So I do have a desire for you to get a fair deal. But, you'll say, but that desire is just... Uh, it, it, it isn't sort of, it's not that what I ultimately want is for you to get a fair deal. That's more, that's what, rather that's what philosophers call an instrumental desire. I desire for you to get a fair deal because that will in turn, you know, lead you to have a high opinion of me, which would lead you to spread that opinion to others, which would eventually bring more money back to me as the shopkeeper. So the idea is that I have an instrumental desire for you to get a fair, fair deal in service of my ultimate desire for me to get more money. So that's possible, but is there any reason to think it's true? Again, is there any reason to think it's true that all of our ultimate desires are self-directed? So I'd like to consider, I, I, I guess, I don't know if it's the most commonly heard argument for this idea, um, that all, de all desires are ultimate, that all, sorry, all ultimate desires are self-directed. Uh, and this is kind of evolutionary argument. So the evolutionary argument for egoism uh, has been endorsed by, um, I guess, you know, some pretty high-profile evolutionary theorists like Richard Dawkins and uh, Richard Alexander, and I'm sure some other Richards. Um, but so, right, so, so, so here's Dawkins' statement of, of the idea. This is from uh, the self book called The Selfish Gene. Humans and baboons have evolved by natural selection. If you look at the way natural selection works, it seems to follow that anything that it has evolved by natural selection should be selfish. Therefore, we must expect that when we go and look at, at the behavior of baboons, humans, and all other living creatures, we shall find it to be selfish. Richard Al and Alexander, leaving aside the question of conscious belief or personal opinion about one's goals or intentions. So here, uh, Alexander is acknowledging that, that you, know, you think that you have these uh, these desires for other people to be happy or for other people to, to get something. Um, but leaving that aside, there is every reason to accept that humans, like other organisms, are so evolved that their interests are reproductive. One consequence is that individuals may be expected to behave so as to serve their own, that is, genetic reproductive interests 
than the interests of others. So I think the quote from Alexander is a bit more telling than the quote from Dawkins, because what we can what what we see here is that he's what he's do, doing is identifying the creature's interest with its genetic or reproductive interest. So I think this argument is uh, not just wrong, but all kinds of wrong. Well, it's at least three kinds of wrong. So the first way in which it's wrong is that you are not your genes. If it even makes sense to talk about your genes having interest, like it's in my genes' interest to reproduce, let's just suppose for the moment that that even makes sense. It doesn't follow that it's in my interest, you know, to reproduce. So I am not what what's good for what's good for me, what's good for my genes are two different things. Suppose you know uh, I'm considering whether to uh, have have intercourse with someone who has a mild uh, STD, right? It might be in my genes' interest to uh, to to go ahead and do it without a prophylactic, um, but it won't be in my interest. Oh, uh, well, in the most case versions of this case, it won't be in my interest to do it. So my genes' interest, if that even makes sense, and my interests are two different things. Um, another important point here is that the environment that I live in is not the environment of the, that my ancestors lived live in when certain behavior uh, or certain genes that dispose the individual towards behave towards certain behavior um, were being selected for. So the, the important upshot of, of this is that. There's certain kinds of behavior that in the environment, as they call it, the environment of evolutionary adaptation, so millions of years ago, uh, certain behaviors would have been selfish, that those same behaviors now aren't selfish, where now we're understanding selfishness is doing what's in our genes' interest. So consider the following behavior. Helping those who you spend a lot of time with, right? That behavior, in the environment of evolutionary adaptation, uh, is to your uh, sort of reproductive benefit because the people who you spend a lot of time with in the evolution in the environment of evolutionary adaptation uh, are, for the most part, family members, and so they share your genes, and so helping them is a way of helping your genes because they they have your genes in them, right? But in our current environment, we don't spend most of our time with our family members, as you know. As college students, you spend the vast majority of your time with people other than, uh, well, most of you anyway, spend the vast majority of your time with people other than your family members. And so in this environment, that same behavior uh, won't be to your, uh, sort of your genes' interest. The third and final point, and I think probably the most important point to make about this argument, is even if we do say, okay, let's just identify our interest with our genes' interest, let's just grant that for the sake of argument, Let's just grant that our current environment is sufficiently similar to uh, the environment of our ancestors. Let's just grant that. The biggest problem with this argument, I think, is that it, it confuses function with motivation. It's saying, look, these, these behaviors were selected for because uh, they promoted reproductive success. And they want to conclude from that that, therefore, what's motivating you when you engage in these behaviors is reproductive success. That's, to put it mildly, crazy. So, you know, look, you know, the, 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 sort of the, the behavior of drinking water was selected for because that behavior got water to my cells. I don't know how this really works, I don't know what's going on there, why they need water. Uh, but anyway, so it gets water to my cells. But it's crazy to think that, like, when I drink water, what's motivating me is the desire to get water to my cells. Like, I mean, Children drink water, they don't even, they can't, they don't even have a concept of, of cells, right? So this is clearly not what's, what's motivating them. All right, so the third and final argument is this, uh, I guess you think of it as an appeal to authority, but I think there's a better way to think of it. So suppose on this one sort of caricature of Thomas Hobbes and Adam Smith, they were both believers in psychological egoism, uh, Hobbes being um, famous 17th century political theorist, and Smith, uh, famous um, 18th century uh, economist. Supposedly, they built these very powerful, successful theories on the basis of psychological legalism. So isn't that some reason to believe it's, it's true? And there's a very short answer to this, which is, no, they didn't believe psychological egoism. If you go and read the text, you, you'll find that this is not their view. They had a kind of mixed view. Um, you know, you know, yes, they thought that people were to a large extent 
a large extent selfish, and it was that view upon which they built their political and economic theories, but they certainly did not think that we were purely, um, purely selfish. All right, so the good news, if there are no good arguments for psychological egoism, and there seems to be some pretty good reason to, to reject it, the good news is that uh, you know, human nature is not as nasty as you, might have, as, as you might have thought. The bad news, of course, is that um, you know, these ethical theories that presuppose that psychological egoism is false are still in good standing, well, it's good standing they were ever in, and uh, so you still have to pay attention to the class. That's it.